good morning, Heartland. I'm so glad you're with us today. I'm so glad we're family and we get to see each other today. I don't get to see you, but you get to see me. You're in for a great service today. My name is Laurie, and I would love it if you would just put your name in the chat and tell me where you're watching from. It could be the car, it could be somewhere around the city, around the nation, or around the world. So we would love to hear from you. Put your name in the chat today and um, we will be touching it base and, and just seeing what's happening with you guys. We're in for a beautiful day today. It's pretty here in Indiana. It's finally warm and feels a little bit like summer, so we're so glad for that. Um, my name again is Laurie and I'm Pastor Darren's wife here at Heartland, and uh, our church started about 21 years ago, and um, just, we have an amazing church, an amazing, um, beautiful church building, so if you have a chance to make it to one of our services today and you're in the area, we still have a 10.30 and a noon service today, and so today's going to be a great day. I have an incredible dream teamer here with me today. His name is Ronald. I'm going to have him join me for a second. Morning. Yeah, yeah. Ronald, how long have you been serving on the Dream Team? I've been on the Dream Team for four years now, and uh, it's a great service, and I'm glad to do it. What do you do here? Well, right now I'm in uh, First Steps, where we welcome people as they come in and help new visitors or any questions someone has. We're here to help them as much as we can. That's awesome. That's awesome. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, how long you've been in, living in Indy? And well, I've been in Indy back and forth. I came here in 1970. And then I left in 1920, no, 1997, and I came back in 2015. I was out in New Jersey for almost 20 years with my job, and I retired, so I came back here. Nice. And so I've been back here since uh, 2015, and I've been, I searched for a home, church home, and I found it here in Heartland, That's and awesome. I'm glad to be of service here. I'm impressed you know dates like that. That's that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> Ronald and I were in a small group together called Be The Bridge, mm -hmm. which was an, such an impactful group. And then he went on to lead a small group, um, a Be The Bridge small right. group, and right. um, just so glad to know him. Yeah. So um, you are in for a great service today. We're going to have some worship. We have a great message. And, you know, just take the posture that you're going to hear from God today. If you're in your, in your living room, stand up, get your kids around, and get ready to just worship the Lord today. And he'll speak to you, I promise, if you just have that posture and you're ready to hear from him. So we're excited you're with us today, your family, and um, we hope you feel that. Correspond with us in the chat today. We just can't wait to hear what's going on in your life and any prayer for any reason. Put all, it, you can also put that in the chat or if you want it a little bit more anonymous, you can put it on the prayer wall today too. So we are so glad you're here and um, we're going to get ready to go into service in just a minute. We'll see you then.
song that overcomes the raging. Let faith be the song.
Jeremiah 32, 27 says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And we all know the answer is no. There's nothing too hard for him. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, you're working in this place, and I worship you, Jesus, I worship you. You are here, you're moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, and you are here. darkness my god that is who you are come on let's sing that out say you are the, the way maker miracle worker promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here touching every heart i worship you
Give God a great hand of praise today. We love you, Lord. We praise your name. We love you. I love singing that song. It's so true. God is gracious, and he is compassionate. He is merciful, and he's so good to you today. And I want you to know that no matter who you are or where you feel you are with God, God's love is unchanging. He is faithful. And what's so good about God is he's always open to the humble. There's never been a person who approached him with a humble heart that he ever turned away. So the good news today is there's still sight for blinded eyes and there's still healing for people who are brokenhearted. I wanna pray for people who are brokenhearted today. I know that that might be some of you, but I know it's certainly a lot of people in our nation today. Another tragic shooting in Buffalo and a racist, uh, racially motivated killing. That just breaks my heart once again, and I just want to pray for our nation. I want you to pray for each other too. Will you quickly just say that, find the name of the person near you because I want to ask you to pray for them in just a moment. If you're online, go ahead and put your name in the chat. So glad you're here. Glad you're a part of our church service today, and we want you to pray for each other as well. So let us know where you're logging in from, where you're watching from, and then we're going to pray. See, one of the things about our church is I want you to know you're never just attending or watching something. You're part of a community. And what a community does is they pray for each other. So every Sunday that you come, someone's going to pray for you by name. So I want you to remember the person you just met. I'm going to give you a moment to say their name before God in just a moment. So will you join me? Father, we just love you today. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you're good. Thank you that you're merciful and you don't treat us as our sins deserve. I ask you right now to have your way and let your kingdom come in the heart and life of every person. Take things that are crooked and make them straight. Take things that are painful and broken and will you heal? God, will you restore? Will you open the eyes of someone who just can't see and doesn't know what to do? A person who is just afraid of tomorrow. God, you are the provider. You provide everything that we need. And right now I'm asking for peace. I'm asking for you to give peace that passes all understanding, that you would silence the voice of the accuser, that voice that says one is not enough. And I pray that there would be just an atmosphere of peace for every person connected to this moment. Lord, that they can hear your voice. You told us to be still and know that you are God. So in this moment, I wanna pray that we would all know you a little bit better. And I pray that you would meet the need of the person on my right and on my left. Go ahead and say their name or put their name. And pray for the person in the chat right now. God, we just pray that you would meet their needs today. I pray you'd bring comfort and healing. And God, I pray even for those moms and dads and spouses and children who have lost their loved one today in another tragedy. God, I pray for mercy. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, you've called us to make a difference in this world, to be salt and light and to permeate our society like yeast. And I pray that you would help us today. Fill us up one more time. Give us more insight, more wisdom. Inspire us. Help us to hear your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, give God praise, everybody. Hey. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. So good to see all of you. For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Darren. I'm the pastor here at Heartland Church. So glad you're here. Can you help me welcome everybody who's here for the first time? Thanks for coming. And while you're at it, welcome your church family online. Glad you're with us today. Hey, for those of you who just came, I want to let you know that we love you. We're glad you're here. There's a worship guide you received on your way in, and there'll be a little bit of information about our church in there. Also, there's a little card on the inside that says a connection card, and that's really for everybody. I'd love each of you just to take a moment sometime during this morning, write me a note, uh, put a prayer request on the bottom where you can tear that off and place that in the offering at the end. We, we pray every single day and every Saturday we pray for all of your needs. And so we'd love to come alongside you, carry a little bit of whatever it is you're going through for a moment. And uh, we just want you to know we care. We love you so much. Uh, there's some, a lot of great things happening. Take a look at the news. Uh, give somebody a high five or a fist bump and say, welcome to Harlan. Check out the screens. everyone and happy Sunday. My name is Deja and I serve on the communications dream team here at Heartland. We're so glad you're joining us today. 
If you're new to Heartland or want to learn more about who we are as a church, we would love for you to join us today at step three of the Heartland Growth Track. The Growth Track is designed to help you grow in your relationship with God, connect to the church, and reach your full potential. At today's class, you'll find out what it means to make a difference and connect to the opportunities available right here at Heartland to live out your purpose and serve others by using your God-given gifts. You'll also have the opportunity to become a member. If you'd like to attend, head over to our chapel during the 10.30 a.m. service. We'll see you at the growth track. Serving on the Dream Team is a great way to make a difference with your life and use the talents God has given you. Right after today's message, in the lobby, you'll have the opportunity to connect with our Dream Team. You can ask your questions and check out all the ways you can jump on a team and make a difference in the lives of others. I'm really excited for all that God is going to do today. I know you'll enjoy today's message, and I pray God's blessing over you, because today is going to be a great day. We are in week number four of a series called Begin, How to Know God. And it's a series that I've been praying about and writing for uh, almost six months as I was getting ready for Easter, thinking that I really wanted to communicate that God's not just a subject to be studied, but he's a person to be known. And if you, uh, if you participate and you just take a step towards God, he'll reveal himself to you. And so I wrote a little book called Begin, How to Know God, and I'm sure many of you have it. If you're just here for the first time, you can pick up one of these books that are by any of the tables with the balloons. And I'd love for you to, I'd love for you to get one, or you can just text the, the word BEGIN to 68,000 and you can get a digital copy of it. But we're in the fourth week of a series as we've been helping people know God, and then God wants you, once you get to know him, he'll give you the power to get free from things in your life that have held you back. Everybody has hurts and habits and hangups that keep them focused on yesterday. They can't seem to get past what happened. But if you could ever could get free, God has a great purpose for your life that's so much bigger than you. And he wants you to make a difference. And you know, when, you make it, when you're making the difference that you know that you were made to make, that's where your joy is, that's where your fulfillment is, that's where life is. And so uh, we have a, a membership class, we call it the Growth Track. It happens just on a ro rotating cycle. You can be part of that right during the next service and you can go a little bit deeper into it specifically. It's like the lab to help you figure out what your purpose might be that God has given you uh, to make a difference in this world. But today we're gonna pick up on week number four of this whole idea of making a difference. And I'm so honored today to have a person who has made such an enormous difference in my life, actually from a distance. But I wanna introduce to you to uh, someone that is so uh, important to me and I can't adequately really explain the impact that he's had on our church. Uh, Bob Merritt, uh, 31 years ago, was called to pastor a small, little declining church in the, in the Minneapolis area. And uh, he was just, had so much grit and so much determination and a singular focus to just reach people for Christ with whatever means possible. And he never gave up on that vision. And just this last Easter, Eagle Brook Church reached over 90,000 people for uh, Easter. It was just, it's incredible. It's actually the largest church in our nationwide movement called Converge, but it's the fourth largest church in America. But here's the most important part. You've never heard of Bob, Mar uh, Bob Merritt. Bob, Bob, his church is so impactful. It's making a difference for the poor, for the needy, for the hungry all over the world. And it's, it's such a church of impact. And so many leaders have been helped by the Eagle Brook Association, a, a cohort that I got to be a part of, where they give away and they teach and they inspire young pastors like me, and they did it all for free. But you've never heard about Bob because Bob never made it about himself. Bob has gotta be the most humble and uh, most, uh, just, just humble guy I've ever met with someone who, who's been given so much. And I just say that with great hope. There's a lot of celebrity preachers today who uh, make it about themselves, and there's a lot of people who, you know, you see the big public fallout, but for every one you see, there are thousands more, like Bob, who have made a difference. 31 years of ministry, he retired last year and passed the baton in such a skillful, in such a humble, such a generous way that pastors and leaders around the country will be studying this for generations on how you, how you step out of the way and you let younger leaders lead. He's been making a difference in my life, 
and really in your lives for all this time. And I've asked him to come. I'm so honored he's here. Will you stand and just give a great heartland welcome to my friend and mentor, Pastor Bob Merritt. Ah, thanks for that. Unnecessary, undeserved, really. Uh, hey, it is, it is truly an honor for me to be with you all today uh, at this wonderful church, Heartland. Uh, our church, Eagle Brook in the Twin Cities, has a relationship with your pastor, Darren, uh, that is very special, and through him, we've gotten to know and love your church, Heartland, here in Indianapolis. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Darren is one of the best... Uh, pastors and leaders in the nation, uh, top 1% for sure, and uh, I just so proud of, so proud of what he's, what God has been doing through him and his family and the staff here. Uh, I am so excited for your future, uh, for your present and your future. Just, it's an honor, honor to be here. There aren't many people like Darren today. And so thanks, Darren, for inviting me. Um, by the way, here's a picture of my family uh, back home. I do have a family. And this was taken a couple months ago. It was below zero. Uh, don't be fooled by the smiles. There's a lot of complaining. Why are we doing this, Dad? And, you know, give me a break. And I said, well, I got to show the people in Indianapolis I actually, you know, have a family. So there they are. By the way, this is my wife, Laurie, um, my son, David, and his wife, Sarah, and my daughter Megan and her husband Nellie, they all attend church. We all attend church together there in the Twin Cities, and we're just so blessed to have our family close by and six grandkids. So, uh, hey, today I want to talk about how to make a difference because I think God put within all of us a desire to make a difference. You know, teachers want to make a difference, pastors, salespeople, service and business people want to make a difference, parents want to for their children and family. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 says we, every single one of us, are God's workmanship. God created each one of us uniquely in his image. We are his workmanship, created for what purpose? To do good works. It means we're not here just to consume and be entertained but to do good things with our lives that make a difference. But that's really hard to do if we live in a perpetual state of depletion and exhaustion. You know, if I'm constantly running on empty, constantly drained and depleted, then I won't be able to make a difference because I'm just trying to survive. Because isn't this statement true? You can't give what you don't have. I mean, you really can't give love to other people unless you've experienced love and have love in your heart to give. You can't give wisdom unless you've spent some time in God's Word and, and reading inspiring books and around other godly people, building up your wisdom tank. You can't give wisdom unless you have wisdom to give. I mean, you can't give kindness, joy, or encouragement if you're always unhappy. <laughs> And stressed, and you can't give money if you're always broke. You know, God created us to do good works, to make a difference, but that's really hard to do if you're always depleted. Uh, early in our marriage, we didn't have a lot. Uh, we didn't own a home until we were 34. We didn't have living room furniture until we were 44 years old. So one of the things I personally have struggled with all my life is being generous with my stuff. I like my stuff. But a few summers ago, my daughter and son-in-law were moving from Minnesota to Missouri, and as they were loading up the U-Haul uh, truck, my wife said, Bob, the kids need a grill, so let's just give them ours. I said, let them get their own grill. <laughs> she said, well, we need a new one anyway, let's just give them ours. I said, we wouldn't need a new one <laughs> if we kept the old one. I mean, the wheels were falling off, parts were missing, and then I, I actually had this thought, seriously. I wonder what Jesus would do if he had a grill. <laughs> Jesus probably never even had a grill, had this thought. Probably never had a grill, and if he didn't have a grill, why do our kids need a grill? <laughs> but there went my perfectly good grill onto their truck, and then it was our bed in our guest room. 
My wife said they need a bed for their guest room, so I'm going to give them the one in our guest room. I said, we're not giving them our bed. She said, well, they need a bed, and we need a new one in there anyway. I said, what's wrong with it? She says, it's 30 years old, and it sags. She said, my parents are coming in three weeks, and we'll need a new bed. I said, we're not getting a new bed just for your parents. They're 85. They're used to saggy things. <laughs> but there went our bed. And off we went to the mattress store to buy a new bed, and Laurie's parents never came. <laughs> and I was not happy about that one bit. Same thing happened with our old lawnmower and my favorite rocking chair that they just snuck onto the truck without me knowing it. When we arrived in uh, Missouri to unload the truck, I said, hey, that's my favorite rocking chair. My wife said, you never use it. I said, I might use it if you'd let me bring it up from the basement, I would. So, whenever we visited the kids in Missouri, I grilled burgers on my perfectly good grill, I slept in my perfectly good bed, and I rocked the baby in our perfectly good rocker. But here's my point. The reason they could take all our stuff is because we had stuff to give. If we want to make a difference in our families, in our church, and in this world, we have to have something to get. I, gang, I think there's a bothersome belief in society these days that somehow there's virtue in being depleted. And that if, that if you're successful and well off, you're the problem. But there's no virtue, I can tell you this, there's no virtue in being depleted and dependent. There's no virtue in being so depleted you have nothing to give and can't help yourself or anybody else. And it's not even biblical. Look at 2 Corinthians 9 says about this, God is able to make all grace, I love this word, abound. It means overflowing. It means all you can need, all you can want. God's grace is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, not just some things, in all things, at all times, not just sometimes, having all that you need, at all times, so that you will abound in every good work. God's desire is that you and I abound in every good work. He wants us to abound spiritually, relationally, and even financially so that we can impact this world. Now, if you're a student here today or watching online, or if you've got two or three little kids at home, or you have some sort of illness, you're probably not abounding right now. You might be just surviving, just hanging on. But with God's help, hopefully that's temporary because God is able to make all grace, all goodness overflowing. God's able to do this in your life so you can make a difference. Now, Jesus' most famous story in the Bible is the prodigal son. We all know that the son runs off. He blows his inheritance on wild living. He becomes destitute. And then he returns home to see if the father will forgive him, which the father does. But what a lot of people miss in this story is that the father was very wealthy. His estate included hired servants. It wasn't a modest house with a few chickens running around. It was a vast estate that required servants to manage the property. When his son returns home, the father drapes a robe over his shoulders. He puts a ring on his finger, both symbols in that culture of wealth. Then he throws a grand feast with the finest wine and the choicest cuts of beef to celebrate. But most of all, the father had stored up a wealth of love and forgiveness for his son. And he gave it freely from a full heart. He gave all this bounty, food, and love. Why? Because he had it to give. But I'm telling you, for some people, the idea of giving anything, even their love, is so defeating because they're so depleted and needy themselves, they're just barely hanging on. 
And gang, if that des- describes any of you, I get it. I do. These past year, two years have been brutal. And the word I hear among people, even, you know, relatively healthy people, is, Bob, I'm just so tired. I'm exhausted and full of anxiety. But gang, none of us have to stay that way. I get it. It's okay to receive for a while. We all go through tough times and slumps and highs and lows, but we don't have to stay there. Return to the Father. He's waiting for you. He's got a robe and a ring, an unlimited supply of everything you need, but we have to go to him and we have to receive it. Receive his forgiveness, his healing and help. I'm telling you, God is able. By the way, it's his work, not our work. God is able to do this in your life. He is able to make all grace, I love this word again, abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having everything you need, you can also abound in good work. Question. If you're not abounding right now, especially as it relates to finances, would you like to know how? You know, from a biblical perspective, so that you can increase your ability to make a difference in your church, your family, and world. Again, you know, with inflation these days, fuel prices, uncertain ge- geopolitical tensions, you might think abounding is impossible in this culture. But the Bible says with God, nothing is impossible. And I believe there are huge opportunities today to earn and get ahead and make a difference like never before. I really do. I believe our world is hurting and we can make a difference. Uh, Several years ago, I read three books. Millionaire Next Door, The Millionaire Mind, and Everyday Millionaire. (laughs) Uh, Same topic. And the premise in these books, though, was the majority of millionaires in America are not doctors, lawyers, and CEOs. But the average millionaire are everyday people who work everyday jobs. That gaining financial stability does not come from luck or inheritance or high-paying jobs, but by slow and steady saving over a long period of time. One author interviewed 10,000 millionaires and asked this question. He said, what do millionaires do that everybody else doesn't? They defined a millionaire as a person whose net worth is a million dollars or more. Now, a net worth includes your your car or cars, your house, savings minus your debt. And what they found is that most millionaires got there not by luck, not by inheritance or high-paying jobs, but by working hard, living simply, and steady savings over a long period of time, 20 to 30 years. Now, my goal today is not to uh, become a millionaire or to tell all of you how to become one, but it is my goal to help you abound in every area of your life so that you're not depleted and dependent because if you're depleted, you'll struggle to make a difference. By the way, there's over 800 verses in the Bible that talk about money, so we should as well on occasion talk about it. You should also know that the Bible never condemns those who are wealthy. Abraham was extremely wealthy, the father of, you know, our faith, really, uh, Jewish, Judeo-Christian faith. You know, David and Solomon were both extremely wealthy. Job, after he lost everything, God blessed him with incredible wealth. In the parable of the, of the talents, Jesus praised the servant who took his money and doubled it, and he condemned the servant who did nothing with his resources. So God is not against money, only the love of or the obsession with. That's the problem. By the way, some people live on very little and they still abound. You know, some of the most joyful, generous people don't have a lot, but in the next few minutes, I want to talk about how to abound financially so that we can make a difference in our church and in our families 
and in this world. So three way, or four ways, three ways to abound. First way is stop believing the myths. I have four quick myths for you. Stop believing. Myth number one, wealthy people inherited their money. It's a myth. 79% of millionaires got zero inheritance. Instead, they worked hard, lived simply, and saved steadily. Myth number two, wealthy people make risky investments and get lucky. 80% reached millionaire status through their employer-sponsored retirement plan. 401Ks, 403Bs, whatever, whatever your plan might be. And they didn't sit home in their pajamas the last two years playing video games. Now, I know none of you did that, but I've heard that some people, you know, that's their deal. So, they, they, myth, number, myth number three, wealthy people get rich quick. Very few, only 5% got there in under 10 years. Most took 20 to 30 years of steady working and steady saving. Myth number four, uh, wealthy people have high-paying jobs. Now, some people obviously do have high-paying jobs who are wealthy. But of the 10,000 millionaires interviewed, the top three jobs, get this, were engineer, accountant, and teacher. Um, One-third never had a six-figure dollar salary, and only 7% had a salary of $200,000 or more. Again, the goal isn't to become a millionaire. The goal is to abound and be a giver and difference maker in the lives of your family, friends, church, and world. And the first way to abound is stop believing the myths that wealthy people got there by luck, inheritance, or high-paying jobs. Second way to abound is you got to stop the leaks. Stop the leaks. Now, leaks are all the little cracks in our spending habits that leak money out of our lives, and we all have them. I have them, you have them, everybody does. For example, I have wanted a nice pair of gray pants for over a year, but I haven't found the right one that's under $40. I don't know if I ever will. <laughs> so a few months ago, my wife and I went on a date to the outlet malls. <laughs> and I had one goal, to find a nice pair of pants. I went to every store with laser focus, and at the end of the day, I, I came home not with a nice pair of gray pants that I needed, but three golf shorts that I didn't need <laughs> and had no intention of getting. What happened? Well, I leaked. I, I sprung a leak. So where do you leak? Don't think about that too long. But gas stations, are, <laughs> gas stations are primary places to leak. You know, you go in with an $80 gas bill, and you leak 20 more on donuts, pull tabs, and a Mountain Dew liter of Mountain Dew. Well. Nothing wrong with that. That's your deal. But at the end of the month, you've leaked over $100 that you could have spent much more wisely at Bass Pro Shops <laughs> or Cabela's. New cars, some of the worst leakers on the planet. Not against new cars, but Dave Ramsey says this, the average net worth millionaire does not drive a new Mercedes or Lexus, but a four-year-old car with 41,000 miles on it and eight out of 10 buy it debt-free Without a car payment, they save up oh, and pay cash. Now, again, if you can afford it, have at it. But the biggest leakers of all are interest payments on credit cards. Ralph Dutera, CEO of Spectrum Financial, writes these words. He says, people who pay 12 to 20 percent interest on credit cards will forever live in poverty if you don't have the money to buy something. Here's a thought. Don't buy it. Pray for it. Seriously. A save for it. And then wait for it. 
Proverbs 22, 6, the borrower is a slave. To the lender, it means that those who borrow money and can't pay off their credit card debts each month are in bondage. Yeah. About 20 years ago, I was sitting with some of our staff, and I was telling them how my wife and I always pay cash for used cards, used cards, never have credit card debt. We, we rarely eat out. We just actually don't like going out to eat. And we always give 10% or more to God's work in the church. And I just assumed all my staff lived that way. One of them finally broke the awkward silence and said, you're a freak. <laughs> uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, nobody lives that way. But now he does. We're both financial freaks and loving it. I, I say this in total love and in, in total care for you. Um, it, it should never enter your mind to finance a TV, computer, phone, appliance, or wedding. Um, anybody know what this is? <laughs> yeah, it's a newspaper. It, it, you know, people write articles and then they print it. And you can actually buy these in gas stations or whatever, which I do on occasion. But this article was titled, Married to Debt. Talking about people who go into debt for their wedding. <laughs> and it said, couples take out loans to pay for weddings. The author writes these words. He says, there's nothing, there's nothing necessary about an expensive wedding. That's worth the whole article right there. Now, if you're about to get married and you know, you're, don't worry, you're fine, maybe. <laughs> uh, there's nothing necessary about an expensive wedding. He writes, you can spend $30,000 on a wedding. By the way, the average wedding today is $28,000. Insane. Or you could use it as a down payment on a house. There's a thought. These loans, he says, sound great while planning, but afterwards I hear a lot of regret. People who want to make a difference and abound avoid debt. Dave Ramsey says, the only debt I don't scream about is a mortgage. Um, some of you maybe feel a little down and defeated right now. Please don't. We all make mistakes. I've, I've made so many financial mistakes, you'd, you'd be shocked. But today, maybe, can be a new day for you, for some of you, where you can start turning that around. Third way to abound today is to work and save. You know, this seems obvious, but you can't build wealth and abound if you don't work and save. I, I'm just shocked at, <laughs> at how many think that somehow they'll just get lucky and kind of fall into money. You know, that they'll win the lottery or inherit a windfall or rely on the government to give them free money. Don't even get me going on that. <laughs> I will say this. If you rely on your parents, government, lottery, or anybody else beside yourself to get ahead financially, you won't get ahead. Dave Ramsey says your number, this is so, so true, your number one wealth-building tool is you. God's creation with a, with a sound mind, a strong body, and energy and creativity. This is so, so true. Hallelujah. So true. 80% of millionaires surveyed did not inherit a dime, and they didn't win the lottery. They got there by working normal jobs and saving a percentage of every paycheck in their 401ks over a 20 to 30-year period. I want to show you a graph just to kind of illustrate this. If you started at age 25 saving $250 a month and put it in a mutual fund, age 25, $250 a month, at, at age 65, 40 years later, you'd have $1.3 million. Now, notice something about this graph that when your first 10 years, it's like, I'm doing this saving... Bring that back if you would. Bring the graph back, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm doing, and there's almost no movement. 
Even through the first 50, but boy, by year 20, she takes off. And that's, that's the, the, the magic of compound interest. You say, where am I going to get $250 a month to put away? I don't know. Cable? <laughs> Amazon Prime? I don't know. I'll guarantee you got some slush just like I do. You know, you, you can find it somehow. Memberships to things, I don't know. But I want to ask you, are you doing this? Do are you working? And are you saving a percentage out of every paycheck? By the way, what a great time to land a great job and earn money right now. COVID created a whole bunch of sofa sitters and Dorito munchers. <laughs> Don't be one. And could I say a word to the 20-somethings here? Love the 20-somethings. Um, there's a great book out, and by the way, you should watch her TED Talk. It's by Megan J. Meg J., it's called The Defining Decade, Why Your 20s Matter. And she talks about it's in your 20s when you should be gaining an education, gaining skills, getting a jump ahead, gaining contacts. Start earning money in your 20s. Don't waste your 20s. If you wasted your 20s, don't waste your 30s. If you're wasting your 30s, don't waste your 40s, 50s, or 60s. If you're 79, go ahead and waste a couple of years. I mean, you've probably <laughs> earned it. But Proverbs 13, 11, whoever gathers money, here it is, little by little, makes it grow. Here's the idea. Saving plus time. This is how you get there. Why don't some people do this? Well, Simply, they lack the discipline to wait and delay their gratification. You know, they see what other people have on HGTV. We all do. And instead of being content with what they have, they max out credit cards, lease new cars, finance new furniture, and they get what they want now because they don't have the discipline to wait and save. People who abound, don't do that. They wait and delay, sometimes for 10, 20 years. So, don't believe the myth. Stop the leaks and work and save for 20 to 30 years so that, so that you can abound and make a difference in this fantastic church and in your family and in our world. Uh, 20 year, years ago, I, our church took out a loan of $28 million to build a new campus. And man, we chipped away at it. 10 years later, we were still 17 million in the hole. It was just like a cloud that hung over our head. Year after year, we labored under this debt but then a guy by the name of Fred Martin started attending our church, and he got saved. And God changed his life, and he was so grateful because he knew that the seat that he sat in every week, the seat where he met Jesus, had been paid for by somebody else. You know, someone else built the buildings before he came. Someone else paid the bills provided the seat so guys like Fred could find new life. Fred's a close friend of mine these days. He's done very well financially. In fact, so well that he decided to make a difference with our $17 million debt. He decided to pay it off. And he did. But this past year, Fred went through what I believe is the most painful loss that a person can go through. And in that moment, none of his financial resources could help him. What carried him through was simply his faith and trust that God still loves him and still has a plan for his life. I want you to see this video, and then I'll come up and close real quick. My name is Fred Martin. 
I'm 75 years old. I've been a professional investor for 50 years. I love what I do and have been able to be very successful at that. I'm also a father of three sons and a grandfather of three kids. And I'm married to a wonderful woman named Sue. So I'm one of these people that I love to do lots of stuff. One of my lifelong passions has been flying. I got my license 50 years ago and I went through owning a succession of airplanes. I started with little single engine planes and now I fly a jet that goes to 45,000 feet and goes 540 miles an hour. Uh, I love to read, play tennis, golf, love taking walks with my wife and our two dogs. I just love to do lots of stuff. So all those roles I have and all those things I love to do, they're great. But that's not the identity that I have. What defines me is my relationship to God. But it took me a long time to figure that out. And I didn't become a Christian until my early 50s. Yes, you are a good boy. I got divorced after a long time being married. I was married for 30 years. And one of the key factors in the divorce was that I had no faith basis to my life. I mean, literally no spiritual basis to my life. I hadn't been in church in 30 years. I was fearful, I was empty. I didn't understand why, but I had no rock. I had nothing to fall back on except the idea that if I could just be successful enough, I'd be okay. And it wasn't enough. You know, when you think about financial success, you know, I always want to remind yourself is, you know, what if I gain the whole world but lose my soul? And that's kind of what was happening to me. So when my marriage fell apart, I realized that I needed to figure that out. So it started a long journey to try to understand Christ and understand what it all means, what it means for me. It took a long time. But I ended up really radically transformed. When I put my trust in Jesus, I found peace. I found ability to experience joy. I had much better relationships, much more honest relationships. I met Sue because she's a godly woman and we were equally yoked to Christ. My leadership improved and I became a better investor because I put financial success in the proper perspective. I mean, it was just like a cascade of things. My life just got infinitely better. But just because I became a believer, that didn't shield me from, you know, some really, really tough things that have happened to me since I became a Christian. And in fact, in this last year, I've dealt with one of the most difficult and painful things that anyone could possibly go through. So on May 12th of 2021, I got a call that nobody wants to get. It was my son, Teddy's wife. And she called me to tell me that he'd been seriously injured in a biking accident. And he was an expert bike rider. And he was on his way to Hennepin County Medical Center. So I jumped in my car and headed down there. I got there shortly after he did. And he was laying there, he was in a coma. And the doctor came in and the news was not good. She said that he had some bleeding around his brain stem, which is the super highway between your brain and the rest of your body. And she said that was not a great sign. So we had to wait until the swelling went down to see if there was any improvement in his condition. So we waited about a week for the swelling to go down. And I'd been praying through the whole period. I was unashamed to ask God to heal my son fully. And if you decide to take him, I'll accept that too, but please heal him. And then the, the neurosurgeon dropped the bomb on us and said, we're not seeing any improvement. And so we took him off a respirator and he died the next day on May 25th. He was 43. He was a devoted father, devoted husband, and uh, just a wonderful young man. When he died, I remember trying to expel the grief. It was just, it's hard to describe. You know, I held him right after he was born. When your child is hurt and you have unlimited resources, I would have flown him anywhere in the country. I would have done anything, but no amount of money could save him. And uh, you're left with trust in God. That's it. That's all you got. <laughs> Say faster, Daddy, faster. Three, jump. Daddy, 
If I didn't have God in my life, I would have been a wreck. I cannot conceive of how I would have handled it. I wouldn't have known what to do, but he was just right there with me. I don't know how else to put it. And it took me some months to understand this. What it did do is I had no anger and no bitterness. If you don't have anger and you don't have bitterness, you just have a sense of loss. And that's priceless. It's not easy at all. You know, it's, I miss him every day. But with your faith as strong, you get up and you soldier on. And there's a purpose to your life and it goes beyond just being a father. It's about serving God and you drive on. That's what you do. After Teddy passed, uh, my faith in God actually deepened. And what I'm finding is the number one place for me to grieve is in church. There's something about being in a church service surrounded by believers with the Holy Spirit present that allows me to let my guard down and grieve properly. And I'm still in the process of doing that. Bad stuff happens. And we're all going to suffer triumphs and losses. The question is, how do you deal with it? And ever since Teddy died, God's extended his hand down to me and I'm hanging on to it for dear life. Every day, he's with me. I trust him more than ever and I'm hanging on. I wonder today if anybody here is just barely hanging on. It might be financial, but maybe it's relational. Or maybe you're single and just tired of it. Or you're married and just tired of it. Or maybe like Fred, you lost someone that's precious and you just don't know how. You don't know how you're going to move on. Gang, there's a God who loves you. I want to leave you with two questions to think about today. Will you, if you haven't already, will you put your hand in his? Say, God, I don't understand, but I still trust you. And the second question is this, will you take a step toward abounding? Maybe it's to give forgiveness, get help. Maybe it's to commit to coming to church every weekend, reading your Bible, whatever it might be. There have been many times in my life when I have felt weak and depleted, wasn't abounding. And so in my office, I had a plaque. Every day I looked at it. It says this, I don't have it memorized. <laughs> no, that's not it. Next one, there you go. I am weak but he is strong and he is with me. I don't want to, but he wants to and he's with me. I can't do it, but he did it all. And he is with me. I just want to thank you for letting me come and share some time with you. You're a great church. I love you. God bless all of you. Great question. Will you put your hand in his? Would you bow your heads for just a moment? Let me pray for you. I don't know where you are today, but I know God is speaking to you. Maybe today's the day that you're ready to say, I need a real relationship with God. Religion won't cut it. Going to church or just studying something is not what it's about. You need to know him. You may feel far away from God or feel distance. You may feel the weight of your past or there's guilt or shame that keeps you from God. But 
God doesn't look at that. He looks at you as a father who loves you. And if you'll reach out your hand to him, he'll take your hand. And so I wanna lead you in a prayer. It's a prayer that will help you to connect with God right where you are. I can't pray the prayer for you, but I can give you some words and I'd like to lead you in it. It goes like this, God, I know that I need you. Just tell him that, I need you. Now say this part, this is the humble part. God, I'm so sorry for holding you at a distance, for living life without you, for going my own way, I'm sorry. And the next part of the prayer is a prayer of surrender. God, I give you control of my life. I want you to lead me, I want you to guide me. I lift up my hand and I put my hand in yours. I wanna follow you. Maybe just say it this way, God, I give you my whole life. Now Lord, for every person praying this prayer, I pray you would just give them hope, a gift of, of this Holy Spirit just coming inside of them, give them life and health and peace. I pray you'd start to lead them forward. I pray they'll look back on their life from today, a short time from now, and not even recognize themselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. Put your hands together and give God praise for every person who prayed that prayer. Wow, what a powerful message that was. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you prayed that prayer just a minute ago with Pastor Darren, and you're just saying, I'm just barely making it. I'm just barely hanging on. And we want to pray for you. We want to know about it. And maybe you made that decision today that, God, I, I'm going to take your hand and I need your help. And if you did, we'd love to hear about it. And we'd love to hear what's going on in your life. The host is going to put a connection card up in the chat right now. Just take a minute and fill that out. Let us know what's going on in your life. Let us know how we can pray for you. And um, we will do that. And we love you. Um, it is time for the offering. And so there's all these ways you can give, but um, the easiest way to give is to text GIVE to 68000, and you can do that right now. I'm so glad you joined us today. Um, there's people from Florida, California, Illinois. I just saw a few of those in the chat, and I just want to say thanks for joining us. Please reach out to us. Let us know what's going on, and we can pray for you. And um, we love you so much. There's still a 1030 and a noon service today, so if you get a chance to join us, we'd love that. We love you. Keep coming back, and we'll see you next week.